Welcome back to the Data Sack Show. Costas, we always talk about getting uh, guests back on the show. And we haven't actually done a great job of that, but it's kind of hard with all the scheduling stuff. But we were able to do it. Uh, Vinoth, who was one of the creators of Apache Hootie, uh, is coming back on the show. And I am really excited because last time we talked to him, his project was in stealth mode. So I remember before the show, he said, we can't talk about, you know, what I'm working on, but it is now public. It's called One House and uh, it's super interesting. It's a data lake house built on Hootie, of course, uh, which isn't a huge surprise. Um, so I'm super excited to learn just more about One House and the way they tackle the problem. But one thing I want to do, um, we got a really good explanation from Vinath last time about the difference between a data warehouse and a data lake. I mean, maybe one of the best explanations we've heard, but one house is squarely in the data lake house space. And so I want to leverage uh, his ability to articulate these sort of, you know, deep technical concepts uh, really well to ask about what the data lake house is and just get a definition. Um, so that is what I'm going to do. How about you? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have a hard time, like, to be honest. We know he's like one of these guys that's like always awesome to chat with him on a deeply technical level. Uh, but I'm also like very interesting to hear more about the product they are building, the business they are building, and his whole experience of going from uh, managing like uh, Apache open source projects to trying to build a business on top of that. And lake houses are also like a very interesting uh, new, let's say like product category out there. And uh, um, I'd love to hear more about that and how he sees the future. So we'll see. I'm pretty sure we are going to have like a lot to chat about with him. There's no question. All right, let's dive in. Okay, outro. <coughs> Here we go. I love talking with that guy, Costas. He, he just has this really incredible ability to like answer questions with a high level of detail, but keep the explanation really concise, which is a, a really challenging skill uh, that I have a lot to learn from. I think... Um, I think probably one of the one of the takeaways for me was the conversation right at the end where he talked about how the market is changing and when he thinks that data lakehouse technology will come down market and potentially even be adopted uh, instead of a warehouse, sort of as the first major like operational data store. Um, in a company, which is really interesting to think about. But at the same time, his point was, well, four years ago, like no one thought about Snowflake as like, okay, you need a warehouse, you just stand up Snowflake, right? And so he said, in yep. another three years, who knows what could happen? So uh, that was just really interesting. And I know I'll be thinking about that a lot this week. How about you? Yeah, I agree with you. That was like a very interesting point. And it's also like something that remains to be seen how exactly it's going to happen um, and what will happen. Uh, what I keep is, um, I mean, okay, there are like many different points that I would keep, but uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed was the conversation that we had about how uh, a lake house as an experience and does like performance and like a couple of different, uh, let's say, like parameters that we put there. Uh, it's going to like to match the experience that we have with data warehouses. And I liked how pragmatic he was about that and saying that, okay, I mean, obviously things can uh, improve a lot, but there are always trade-offs, right? Like you are uh, like, you are not going to have, let's say the exact same experience, but at the same time, you, you are going to have, let's say more of flexibility or like more scalability or like having different capabilities that you cannot have right now. Like, and you will probably not have, ever have with a vertically um, integrated solution like a cloud data warehouse. Uh, we'll see. I mean, it's still early with all these products, uh, but it's always great like to talk with people like him because he gives like a very accurate, it's a prediction uh, of the future. So. 
I agree. All right. Well, many, many more great guests coming up. Uh, Subscribe if you haven't, and we will catch you on the next one. Vinoth, welcome uh, back to the show. This is your second time joining us on the Data Stack Show, and it's so good to have you back. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic to be back, and and uh, you know I look forward to another. Last time around, I think it was a very deep, interesting technical conversation. So I look forward to another, you know, round of interesting uh, data conversations here. Absolutely. Uh, well. For those of our listeners who uh, missed the first episode, um, we ask, have to ask you to do your intro again. So you, can you just give your brief background? And then I'd love for you to finish by last time you couldn't talk about this publicly, but what you're doing today at, uh, at One House. Yeah, um, <clears throat> my name is Vinod and uh, I've been uh, working on open data infrastructure in this area in our own uh, databases, data lakes last 10 years and change. And I started my career at Oracle with the Oracle server data application, then uh, led the key value store uh, uh, in LinkedIn uh, during the time when, you know, key value stores were the, the cool thing that you build. <laughs> <in data. laughs> then I moved on to Uber, which is where, uh, you know, Apache Hoodie happened and uh, we kind of like, you know, brought transactions on top of uh, our Hadoop data lake back in the day and what we call uh, transactional data lakes. I think it's a pretty nerdy engineering name, <laughs> which is very, you know, kind of what is known as the lake house kind of architecture today. I continue to kind of you know, grow the project uh, in uh, the ASF uh, Apache Foundation. I serve as the PMC chair still for Apache Hoodie. Um, and, uh, right, you know, after Uber, I actually had a, you know, a good, uh, spent a good amount of time at, uh, Confluent as well. Uh, I wasn't working on Hoodie. I was working on Kafka. I was working on, um, you know, KSQL DB, if you heard about, uh, that, a streaming database, uh, and, uh, connect a bunch of like other things out, you know, and most recently, I think now I'm super excited, uh, to talk about one house, which is where my current employment lies. I'm CEO founder at One House and with, with you know, our goals is, is to build, uh, bring managed, you know, data lakes uh, or lake houses into existence. Uh, we see a world where um, there are fully managed uh, closed systems and then there is DIY open systems in the world. And we are trying to actually build uh, sort of like that kind of managed experiences on top of open technologies like Apache. Love it. Okay, <clears throat> let's. Um, I'd love to kind of set the stage and focus on a term that you mentioned, which is lake house. And some of our listeners will be familiar with that. Some of them, you know, will have seen it in some sort of marketing materials. I'm sure out there. Um, so I want to ask you for a definition of data lakehouse, but before we go there, could you uh, remind us what the original use case for Hootie was specifically for transactions on data lake? So like, what were you facing in that role inside of the company? And then like, why did you need transactions on data lake? Got it. So, yeah, so for this, I think we, we need to go back to actually uh, 2015, 2016, and uh, Uber uh, was growing very fast. We were building out our data platform, and all we had was an on-prem data warehouse uh, at that time. And while, you know, um, the, essentially we were, you know, uh, hiring fast, we were building a lot of new products, we were collecting, you know, high-scale data, right, Uh so we couldn't fit all this data into uh, into our on-prem warehouse. You know, it's not built for uh, this amount of storage. Um, a Hadoop cluster is like a HDFS cluster, uh, even before Uber, right? Uh, you know, at uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or in many places, Facebook, um, it's been you know it's been scaled to uh, several uh, hundreds hundreds of petabytes at least, right? So we we, we built out our Hadoop cluster, our data lake. And, and here is where I think we had a very interesting uh, problem that, uh, you know, re re remember like at my previous stint was at LinkedIn. Uh, this was a, some, something that we didn't even face at LinkedIn, which is 
Uber is a very real time business. So if it rains, the prices change, you know, mm-hmm. and then there are, thou- and there is a huge operational aspect to the company. There are 4,000 engineers and let's say like, you know, 12,000 people who are operating cities, right? And they all need access to like fresh near real time data about what's going to, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's going on uh, out yep. there, right? So essentially uh, what we uh, found was while we can stand up a Hadoop cluster and dump a bunch of files onto that, uh, you know, on there and, you know, bring Spark or something and write some queries, uh, we were not able to, like, you know, for some of our core data sets at Uber, like the trips, transactions, and these core database tables, we were not able to actually replicate them very easily onto the data lake. We would suffer, you know, multi-hour delays, uh, you know, eight hours, 12 hour delays in first ingesting it and then writing ETLs on top of it. So it it, it, it got to a pretty serious level where, you know, people actually figured out uh, we couldn't run our fraud checks fast enough. So we were actually losing money from fraud. It was like a pretty serious business problem, actually. And and, and um, we actually started to look at, hey, how do we solve this? And, uh, you know, and we essentially actually looked at what we had before that. How were we solving it before Hadoop cluster? Uh, we were, you know, like the on-prem warehouse that we had supported transactions updates. And it can actually do kind of like, you know, you can write ET, like merge style ETLs on top that people currently write using DBT on all of these warehouses, right? So essentially we were like, that's pretty much it. Like we need to essentially build that sort of functionality, bring it to the lake, but do it in a way that we, we retain the, the scalability, all the, the, the cost efficiency, all the different advantages of the lake. And that is how Hoodie was born. So we essentially called it a transactional data lake because, you know, in our mind, what we are doing was, uh, you know, introducing basic transactions, building, you know, some indexing schemes, updates, deletes. Uh, you, you can now, you know, your data lake is now mutable, which means it can absorb, you can get a change record from upstream. You can update the table instead of rewriting the whole thing, right? And that's that's kind of like how, how Hoodie was born. And, and it was pretty like uh, yearly, like it, it came before most of the, the other contemporary very technologies that you see out there. Love it. Um, such a great story. I remember you talking about that in the previous episode and um, just so wonderful to hear the Genesis story again. Um, so you've kind of already answered a lot of those questions, you know, from a historical lens, but define, so, you know, with that context, define the data lake house, especially sort of through the lens of how you view the world at one house. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a, a great question. So actually, one of the um, one of the key, uh, you know, uh, te- technology wise, like the, what a lake house adds to a, a data lake is, as I mentioned, transactions updates, right? It the, it, it it gives you more um, like you know updatability. So you it gives you like uh, impedance match with how you do things on the warehouse, if you think yep. about it that way. Like from a user standpoint. There is also, <clears throat> from a user standpoint, there are two other important aspects though, uh, where um, these are mostly used to kind of, you know, improve the, the baseline performance of the data lake compared to a warehouse. For one is the metadata management. So most warehouses, even cloud warehouses, if you see today, they actually have, pretty good, you know, fully managed metadata systems where if you want to execute a query, you know, statistics for different files, columns, yada, yada, all of these things are sort of, you know, like well-maintained and they're they're organized in a way that queries can be planned very quickly, right? So that is another uh, angle that Mm. the piece of technology that the Lakos adds because lakes were pretty much, you know, files and the individual query engines were uh, you know, high, high like high meta store is basically what we had for metadata management, right? And if you look at what high, but high meta store never tracked any file level statistics or anything. Right. So really, file level granular statistics and all of these things. That's one uh, big area. Like right? the second, which which is where I think in hoodie we spent like a lot of time and uh, around it, and we are like much further advanced. There is what we call table services. 
So if you look at any warehouse, uh, take Snowflake or BigQuery, like you'll find a fully managed clustering service. You'll find like all these like different services that do useful things to your table. And they're all like, you know, self-managing. You don't have, you don't like, you don't write code, right? Um, for all of these things. But yeah. if you look at sort of like, even with the, 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 you know, that is why I feel the table format doesn't do justice to sort of like what we need to build overall. The table format alone is not important. You need like a set of services uh, that rival warehouses mm. um, that can provide you clustering, you know, uh, data loading, ingestion, all these other things. This is where what we fo focused a lot on Hoodie. Uh, and uh, this is, I would say, all these three put together, you know, like the 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 storage format, like the table format itself, you know, accepting uh, updates, deletes, and the, like transactionality, uh, plus um, like a well-optimized metadata layer, plus these kind of like well sell, well managed table services. They give you together. Uh, I imagine like you know, uh, if if you if you if you take a warehouse and break it sort of like uh, horizontally, you get a bottom half of a warehouse today. Where, and then you can fit like a you know query engine like Spark or Kino or Presto or anything really on top, right? Mm. So that in my mind is what a, a, a lake house should be, right? And uh, in in that sense, uh, yeah, that that you know connecting back to one house, this is sort of like what we want to unlock is for people to be able to get this bottom half. Uh, as a service, while they have the choice to pick any query engines, pick and choose. Right. Love that. Um, okay, one more question uh, from me, Costas, um, just to help me and, and our listeners set the stage. So, <clears throat> you know, from a marketing standpoint, uh, Databricks has invested a lot in the lake house term, uh, you know, which is maybe one of the ways that, that a lot of our listeners, including me, are, are just, you know, are familiar with the term or have become familiar with the term. How do you think about one house in relation to, you know, to sort of Databricks flavor of Lake House? Are they similar in terms of like, I love the illustration of the bottom half of the warehouse, but help us understand the differences and similarities. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a great question. So I think Databricks is uh, articulation Lakos is, is is slightly different, right? Uh, I think if you going from the paper, even uh, essentially, it's a Spark Lakos, essentially, or a Spark Databricks Lakos, right? And <clears throat> even if you look at Delta Lake, there are there is an open source version of Delta Lake, and then there's a paid version of Delta Lake. So they essentially have two flavors of the bottom layer, if you will, uh, that I just mentioned. While mm -hmm. they have a top layer, which is a you know super optimized Spark layer, and uh, they, you know Photon and like all of the uh, investments that they they put into that, um, honestly, they can apply to other formats as well, right? It, it's it's end of the day. See, like uh, all these table format games, they're all querying Parquet files at the end of the day. So sure, if you can optimize, I think it's a decoupled problem, and. The, the way they market it is as a full vertical stack against Snowflake, right? That's kind of like at least where I've seen most of their marketing energy being spent so far. Uh, and that's probably because Snowflake is one vertical stack, correct? Yep. So, but if you look at the the pieces overall, it still kind of like aligns. The, the, the biggest problem, and we see this with... Uh, lot of you know hoodie hoodie and delta have been like around for much longer uh, supporting mutable workloads and you know everything right for like three four three years now right in out in production so we we routinely run into this right people want uh, either you know people like hoodie for how rich uh, uh, of a table service ecosystem it has how actually vibrant and grassroots open source the community is are several key technical differentiators like you know in concurrency control or like indexing and whatnot, but they still want like Databricks, you know, uh, soup, like you know Databricks Spark, right? So yep. I think as uh, hoodie, we didn't have to care as much afford that, but as one house, we deeply care about that because somebody who who wants to buy both one house and Databricks should be able to get like a really good end-to-end -end experience. 
so even for us uh, some of the thinking uh, is now very you know customer focused that way um, i would say so there is a slight difference we don't believe in one vertical stack um you know uh, end yep. to end i think uh, this can be accomplished by breaking the the bottom bottom half uh, separately and then fitting every query engines so let me just give you some data right you take like ray uh, flink and then um, you know dask or like any any other upcoming query engine uh, for what it's worth uh, you know between them they have some 50000 60000 st github stars right so it's a, a multi engine is like a new thing there are things like bodo like there's going to be new query engine innovation that's going to happen so uh, i think decoupling the data layer from the compute layer at, yeah. at the, you know the, the the vendor or even at the the the, the saas level is a good thing overall we feel yeah super interesting uh, uh yeah bring, it's almost like bring your own interface to the bottom layer um or multiple interfaces um which is super interesting okay costas i could keep going but please uh <laughs> i'm actually more interested in what you're going to ask than what i've already asked yeah oh, oh come on like that's not true i think you are like asking all the interesting questions i'm i'm boring i'm just asking like a little bit more technical stuff that's all uh but uh yeah okay i have like something that uh -huh. uh, i really want to ask you vinod because you mentioned something you said that there is a number of services uh that like a lake house need to have like in order to rival uh, warehouses yeah. and i really like like the, the word rival first of all yeah uh but can you tell us like let's i mean you mentioned them but like let's enumerate like these services again so like our audience like um, has like much more clear uh, um, idea of like what we are talking about in terms of like technical services there got it so let's start from the from from the initial right like you need uh, you need a service that can uh, you know ingest data first of all right and and we we uh, built an ingestion system in hudi from like you know 3 3 years ago so this is similar to a auto loader kind of uh, or snow pipe or uh, you know what, what i don't know exact the word it's called like mm -hmm. the product it's called so i think there's an ingestion system that can like load data that we you dump to cloud storage or different sources that's one right mm -hmm. and and the and there is reasons for it to be like sort of be aware of the sync because you can do checkpoint management and any other things very very easily if if the system actually understands that it's it's hudi it's writing to right number 2 uh when you update uh, data on underneath what happens is we version files you you create garbage right there is you're writing new versions of files and you you the old version of files somebody needs to clean up this is what we call cleaning in hudi and what uh, you know is called like vacuuming i think in in delta lake uh and you need a service that can actually know you can't tell it hey i want to read in x versions or something and then it can automatically do this for you right that is one the the third thing uh, as you know failures happen when you're writing to a table and uh, you have like some uh, leftover files uncommitted data lying around you need you need systems that can like you know services that can clean the data so that um, you know these these like dead files don't litter up your tables and things like that um number 4 um this is slightly specific to hudi but hudi supports a merge on read storage type where we can actually land data very quickly into a row based format or um, you know flexibly in a column based format and then later sort of like compact it right and when we say compaction uh when what we mean is what compaction means in databases like you know cassandra hbase or it's like compacting delta files into a base file so you need a service that can do that and hudi's compaction service can for example like keep compacting even while the riders are going on right as you can imagine uh, like at at a uber or like tiktok like where this like stream of high volume data coming in it's impossible to stop and do occ optimistic concurrency control and all for these things so you need like service like this again i'm making the case that this has to be deeply be aware of the services need to be aware of each other and and that is how databases are written, yeah. right the the other one is clustering service like uh, z or we we implemented z ordering hilbert curves uh, and like just like linear sort order clustering so fundamentally what a table format metadata layer can do is remove 
bottlenecks in planning, right? It can store file listings and statistics, which is used to plan. But end of the day, if you look at, uh, um, you know, most warehouses, if, if for like, you know, high performance sensitive reports and stuff, people actually, you know, tweak performance by clustering and playing with the, with the Invertica, I think it's called projections and they, they have different names and different things. But you, you tweak the actual storage layout to squeeze performance, right? And then you need some uh, service which can actually, you know, understand the right patterns that are happening in the table, uh, schedule these clusterings, execute them. If they fail, they retry, right? So what Hoodie actually, the, the bulk of the value that we add, we believe is, you know, in, in this layer where we, you know, you write to a Hoodie table, all of these services will be scheduled, executed automatically. They can fail, they'll be retried. You know, otherwise, if you take take like a very thin table format uh, as an alternative, then you need to write all these jobs yourself. And what I've seen from the my LinkedIn days and the last ten years living through the the the, the, the Hadoop wars and Cloudera Hot and Words, all of this thing is this. Everybody focuses on the format, like you know, as if like you solve the format and then everything's. But open alone doesn't cut it, right? That is the painful lesson that we should learn from the rise of cloud warehouses. Uh, what we should we should focus on these standardized services, and they take years to get like standardized and kind of like you know hardened in production scale like this. Mm -hmm. I think this is the main thing that that we are not right now even around Lakehouse uh, marketing by any vendor. I don't see enough emphasis laid on laid on some of this. I've recently started uh, noticing that, you know, reasons uh, Dremio had some content around this recently. I think Starburst had some recently, but it's a very recent thing that has happened in the last few months. And this is what we've been at for last three years. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hodi. Okay, so just to um, make sure that like I, I also like understood correctly, right? Uh, we start like our foundation is a data lake where we store the um, parquet or our C files, let's say parquet, like that's the, the standard. Sure. Sure. And on top of that, then we need like a number of uh, services. I counted five. I yeah. hope I didn't miss anything. Probably a couple uh, more. Yeah, um, but let's say the, 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 at least like the most fundamental ones, right? So sure. we have like, we need like an initiation process there. We need some service that's going like to prepare the data and like make them like available. Mm -hmm. Um, we have vacuuming or let's say cleaning uh, and taking care of like all the version files and like all the stuff that are happening like on a low level to make sure yeah. that we implement concurrency. We have some kind of garbage collection. Let's say I'm, I'm using sure. garbage collection yeah, just yeah. more uh, like a broader term. Uh, compaction, which compaction from what I understood is like uh, more of a specific use case for Hoodie because you have the columnar and the row based like representation. So you at some point take these two and you merge yeah. them into one or something. Is this correct? Yeah, it's correct. I think it's it's slightly different. See, mo most of the other two projects are written more as a file statistics tracking system, right? This mm -hmm. is where compaction is not new at all to let's say RocksDB or LSM stores or anything in the like the, the database world and as you know like i i come with that background so mm -hmm. so compaction is more about controlling i want to write smaller amount and then lay like i'm more like you know queue up a lot of these updates later merge them instead of merging them right away okay i think that that is the 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 the, the key uh technical uh re rational for compaction Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Is this like something similar to like like what happens when like tombstones are like, for example, uh, used and then you go and like remove Cut. the tombstones from there so you can actually like uh, roughly make deletions or not? R roughly, like if you if you read a block structured merge trees, uh, LSM trees, for example, they will talk about there's a whole bunch of signs around how to balance write cost and read cost and merge cost. And that that it, it's a very very uh, you know widely adopted database technique, uh, right from Google's Big Table to Cassandra to HBase to RocksDB to LevelDB. That that that's all uh, they use there. 
Awesome. And then the fifth one has to do with uh, what you call like clustering, which is more about like how you can optimize like on a lower level um, the data, how it is stored. So you can actually do uh, improve performance, right? Is this correct? Does this have to do with encoding or like give us like a little bit more of like information? Yeah, about yeah. Yeah, so so I think uh, clustering changes how you sort, how you actually pack records into files, mm -hmm. such that if you know something about the query, let's say for example uh, you are a you are a SaaS organization and you have thousands of customers, and then you're collecting logs from them. So and then you know that your query patterns mostly are you know you'll query for one customer at a time, then. Mm -hmm instead of spreading this cust like data across all the parquet files in your table or a partition what you can do is you can cluster them so that uh, the records similar to uh, one customer is in like a fewest number of files which means okay. when you query them you read the smallest amount of data right this will give you 10 12x like you know like orders of magnitude of query performance or yeah. even uh, while I feel compared to, let's say, file listings. File listing is a real problem only for very large tables, mm -hmm. uh, right? So related to all that, this, this fundamentally affects your compute dollars and uh, it can reduce dramatically reduce cost for your lake. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, that's amazing. Uh, my question is... And going back like to the initial question, these are like, let's say the minimum set of like additional services that the data lake needs in order to rival uh, a data warehouse. But there's like a big difference that I see here. And the difference is that with a data warehouse, I don't really care about all that stuff, right? Like yeah. I don't have to know about like all these very technical and interesting like details, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, while in the lake house, like, okay, we have to talk about that stuff. So yeah. How do we change that? Because not everyone wants to become like a database engineer, right? Uh, in order like to query and store their data. Yeah. Un unfortunately, we opened that door when we wanted updates on the data lake, right? Mm -hmm. Because before that, uh, if like the appending some files to a folder and then collecting statistics on it, I think it's a very simple thing to do. It's 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 like. You know, for, conceptually, it's very easy for people to understand. That is, and, and people in the data lake uh, have grown up, you know, uh, thinking about everything as formats, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at the, with, when you introduce updates, you turned it into a database problem now. And if you look at the database world, like you, you don't actually see, I think I made this uh, uh, statement even last time or in a similar thing. You don't see cockroach DB you know, uh, MySQL, everybody saying, let's standardize on some like one format and then build something on top. It's not a thing, right? When when you change into a database problem, the stuff that we talked about, those are the higher order problems, right? Um, so for, and, and for our, to, to answer your question, what do we do to change this? That honestly is the at the core of why we even started One House to begin with. And this is what I uh, what I say in a lot of places. A lot of people have asked me and, and they come talk to us for enterprise hoodie support or something. That is not what we're trying to build here at all. We're not trying to build an enterprise hoodie company. What we've seen, and you've spoken to Kyle, uh, our head of product, who was you know in a different camp before this, right? Uh, tech Technology-wise. Um, the common thing that we see is it takes six to nine months for people for data engineers to become database engineers and platform engineers, understand all these concepts and actually implement them. Mm -hmm. So what if there existed, you know, a similar managed service where you can click four buttons and then you have your, you know, lake house up and running and, you know, it's open. It's, it's meaning like it's, I, let, let's, let's, let, I think open is super overloaded with marketing these days. Let, let's let's truly what we care about is interoperable and extensible, yeah. right? So if, if you have an engineering team, you can go to the project, you know, you can uh, contribute to the project, get a seat on the table, on the PMC. Yeah, that exists. And then it's interoperable. It, it works with every open standard. There is no vendor bias or anything in the project, right? So we need a, like a, tech, a foundational technology like that on top of which we build this managed service. That's mm -hmm. how we are thinking about it. 
uh, even I, I speak to a lot of cloud barrows users as like my my day job right now, right? And and what I see is ultimately they they realize this, right? They 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 start with a, a fully vertical stack because it's fully managed and like you say, people don't even have to care about it. But well, you're signing up for a two year like a migration project two year down the line, right then when you're making that choice. I think fundamentally we need to like sort of bring some manageability to it. Open alone won't cut it. That is what I'm trying to say. Like open alone is not a key business thing, right? People are, customers are looking for how soon can I get my like lake house up and running, right? Mm -hmm. Technology aside. Yep. And we have to focus on that. And, and I feel while it's open as the only kind of, you know, USP against uh, a closed stack or, you know, to take on like warehouses is not, Good enough mm -hmm. in my mind. Cloud era hot enough stride that and fail. Yeah, uh, I would say. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, so all right, having let's say the experience that someone has with like a cloud data warehouse, something that okay, it's good. Like we we are after that, right? Like we want to offer this over like a data lake, and that's what uh, one house like mission is, from what I understand. Uh, so, do you want like to spend like a little bit more? time like to explain to us how we can go from these at least five pretty complicated like technical concepts and services uh, to an experience which with a couple of like clicks uh, on a cloud dashboard um, we can have let's say a lake house up and running and we can start like interacting with it so how does it work? Like, how? What's your vision um, for one house? Like, from a product perspective? Yeah. So, uh, honestly, like, uh, even detaching myself from Huobi, right? If you have to look around now and see what will I pick today to build a, a product experience around, I'd still go and pick Huri because Huri already has most of these services, uh, but they are, you know, it's a library. Huri is a library. You need to adopt it, tweak it. So what we learned from some of our initial kind of like, you know, uh, users that we are working with and everybody is that just by hiding a lot of configuration, uh, just like, uh, you know, we expose a lot of configuration, at least speaking for Hoodie, we expose a lot of configuration, just like any database. Uh, you go to Oracle, go to MySQL, the, the point is to expose a lot of configurations. Administrators will pick it up over time and know what to do, right? I think we have to simplify that. And for example, don't even show file sizes. Why do you care about what the file size should be, right? Mm -hmm. Right now we ask people to go hand tune that, right? Hand tune the parallelism and all of this. So in, in our experience, uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of sort of like auto tuning and intelligent configure management and sort of like, uh, you know, uh, that, that I think is the first ingredient uh, to, to get there. And the second thing where uh, specifically talking about one house, where we back ourselves more is our team actually has operational experience, not just, you know, uh, build it, right? Like I've been on call for a 250 petabyte uh, data lake uh, where I had to like wake up in the middle of the night and recover a table or like do this kind of thing. So that's the second part, which is, Usually in data lake so far, we've not, you know, the user managed the tables, right? And, and, and if you look at uh, Snowflake or BigQuery, if a table is corrupted, user has no like control whatsoever. Like mm -hmm. you, like some Snowflake engineer, data, you know, whatever, Varos, Redshift, Varos, engineers have to figure out what's going on. <laughs> so that's the second part, like building enough manageability, operability into this product where you know, you're taking control away from the user in the in the in the name of simplicity yeah. and getting started quickly. But we need to now build all the the operational kind of chops to be able to pull this part off. I think this is the hardest hardest part. I think J J uh, Krebs uh, Conference CEO like has this thing where he says, you know, in, in ranking programming is easy. What's much harder is debugging that thing. <laughs> What's much much more harder is operating that piece of code. Right. Yeah. And and I think this is where uh, my disappointment with all of the marketing that happens in the data lake land is that we focus very little on these operational aspects. 
it's all super diy and then later we also complain that oh like you know it's not standardized and blah 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 right yeah. we have to build these standard services in a in an operationalize it for people right that's what that's what the the warehouses have done really well i actually admire them for for what they've done in the last uh, 10 years they've actually accomplished a lot absolutely absolutely cool so we start with like uh, auto tuning and management of configuration in general like simplifying let's say the the whole like setup uh, process for user yet there and also um introducing let's say like abstracting the operations right like yeah. making giving let's say like a cloud experience right like uh, there is a team that will stay awake like to take care of things when they go wrong like instead of having to build your own team like to do that and especially like for so complicated um, technologies like these where it's not that easy like to know exactly what might go wrong so i think it makes like total sense and um my next question is i can understand like what well, i think one of the benefits that let's say the cloud warehouse and all the vertical solutions in general that they have is that When something is vertical and you have like complete knowledge and control over all the components, right? Uh, you can control the experience exactly as you want, right? Like you know exactly like how it's going to be experienced by the user. And at the same time, you have like much more control over what kind of optimizations to do, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and we see that like with things like BigQuery and like Snowflake. So. When it comes and uh, there are like actually two questions. One has to do with like the experience, but let's keep it like for next. And let's start like with performance, right? So these systems, like when you are like vertically integrate all the components, you can go there and be like, okay, I'm going to build something like Photon and have like on top of that, like these changes that need to happen like on the different components and make sure that like I squeeze out every piece, of, like every little of like performance out there. Where do we stand with the lake house architecture uh, when it comes like to performance compared to the solutions like uh, Snowflake or uh, even like, yeah, like BigQuery? Yeah, it's a great question. So I f- first for once, I feel like things like Photon could be built uh, on top of like end of the day, going back to my previous statement, uh on the uh, on on the read side right even with the lake house these transactional like uh, formats uh mm-hmm. on the read side all that happens is you are you know getting some statistics and you know planning some query from there on you know your query performance is dictated by uh, things like photon or whether you have like caching or things like that mm-hmm. i feel like uh i think already we proven that this can be built independent of the the like you know in in a very decoupled way yeah. and then if if you now take things like all the table services and all these things that we talked about uh they are pretty decoupled from how the queries process them right i mean you cluster it and then they'll read it that's it like so in in that sense i don't see an like a technical limitation uh to optimizing the stack sort of like vertically mm-hmm. like Uh, how we do it right but i do see that you know there are different companies here there is no single company yes. right like even even for us we routinely work with different query engines there are different projects mm-hmm. you know each you know we, we take like months to like land certain things and like you know it can be like a lot of different friction points in terms of how quickly we can move mm-hmm. forward uh, but i think the performance itself is comes from the engine like a lot from the engine i said at least for interactive query performance a yeah. lot of it comes from the from the engine the mm-hmm. with a with a better integration with things like you know hudi open source hudi or even like one house services we can probably like you know match the experience mm-hmm. where you go and maybe configure clustering in one house while you go query on like you know presto tree or something right like yeah. that that kind of experience you can product experience you can build but i think there are significant cross organizational boundaries and working across yeah. companies i think it, it's going to slow us down there i feel yeah yeah absolutely and like just like to uh reiterate on what you said like okay there's no let's say uh, increasing technical reason yeah. to have like data lake slower than like a data warehouse but 
when you build like the product and how like the user experiences the product, like things get a little bit more complicated. And, like just to give you an example, let's say I have like a setup with Hoodie and Trino or Presto, like I'm running my queries and I, I see like a performance regression at some point happening somewhere, right? Yeah. What do I do? Who do I reach out? Out, like yeah. to debug this thing, like figure it out. Should I come to you uh, on one house or should I go like to the Trino community and ask there? Uh, or is it my data engineer like doing something stupid out there? Like things, well, when I do that, like with Snowflake or, okay, I, Google is notoriously known for its support. So forget Google, let's <laughs> keep on there. <laughs> 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 on Snowflake, but at least at Snowflake, I'll open a ticket and I'll be like, guys, like something goes wrong here, like figure it out, right? Um, and that's like my, the other like part of the question, which comes like to the user experience. So how we can also like as vendors that we believe in these uh, unbundled, let's say, um, uh, DB system uh, of the lake house, how we can deliver at the end the same experience to the user or at least like a similar experience to the user? Yeah, I think the right now there's a lot of fracture and like, for, first of all, there is no standard like, you know, like APIs, right? E even um, I think we attempted this with even Presto, uh, mm -hmm. which is e even the Hive connector, right? We tried to introduce abstraction so that, you know, okay, you, you just like change the way you are getting file listing. You are listing the thing. So we, like, you know, th there aren't even like good uh, abstraction points right now and across these different engines for us to test and guard. I think as these get more standardized, right? All these three transaction formats have their own connectors mm -hmm. now, um, right? At least uh, this is like, you know, PRs out of the, like things landed. I think starting with even basic stuff, investing in some basic things, having like between these companies, testing them, right? I think we have some very basic gaps to fill, uh, I would say. Uh, longer term, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting uh, point that you bring up. Uh, I think end of the day, there will be some level of trade-off that for the user, user where they are consciously choosing, I want the freedom and the flexibility so yeah. yeah, when you go for that, then you have to pick and choose, right? It's like buying Android versus iPhone. Like mm -hmm. sure, like you know, you know the OS, uh, you know the experience that you're getting, but it's going to vary differently based on the underlying hardware and the manufacturer and like yeah. blah blah blah. So you kind of have to go through that. I feel like even with that, uh, you know, once we iron out the basics, I think it'll, it'll get to a manageable level. I don't think it'll be. It'll always be one level, one notch. It'll always be a problem. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it won't be completely eliminated, but I think that's where I feel uh, the the lake, you know, the the, the lake storage players and the, the query engine players have to like work much more closely together yeah. than what what's going on today. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, I I I I agree with what I mean. Obviously, there's a lot of like space for improvement out there. Uh, okay, like all the vendors right now, especially when it comes like to uh, like vendors like One House, because okay, like you just start the, the business, right? Yeah, like it's yeah. still like, uh, it's one thing to have like a open source project uh, and it's a completely different thing like to build like a cloud product on top of that, right? Like it's, Correct. there's a lot to be discovered there. And I would also add, and that's like something that like I really admire like to, uh people like you that okay you are also starting something that it's like completely new right like in terms of uh as a product yeah. category right <laughs> so there's a lot of learning from both sides both from the customer side and also like from the vendor side and this takes time it's very risky but potentially also like super rewarding but there's always going to be, I think, like a trade-off at the end. It's not like, okay, yeah. uh, we're going to have, let's say, the um, Microsoft Access experience with like a lake house architecture, right? Like there's going to be like some kind of uh, trade-off there. Um, okay, so uh, let me ask like a question that is uh, like also like a little bit of like a, a personal like uh, question that I have. So... Let's say right now I want like to start building um, a lake house, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things it's, it's one of the first like 
actually the first service that you mentioned, like the ingestion service, right? Like somehow yeah. you have like to push data into there. Uh, how do I do it together to, uh, today with Hoodie? Like the only way that I can do that is like through uh, this ingestion uh, loader that you have built. There are other ways. Like how 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 does this work? Yeah, I mean it's pretty simple actually. Uh, you go to Docs, and if you go to you know how to streaming ingestion, mm -hmm. it's a single command. Uh, it has like an umpteen sort of parameters. You say what your source is, what your target is, configure a whole bunch, and that single Spark, spark submit command actually can ingest from Kafka, uh, it can ingest from JDBC sources, it can ingest from S3 kind of like event streams, and then it can also do things like it can configure clustering, cleaning, compaction, all of the stuff that I talked about, right? It's mm -hmm. almost like running a, a database uh on itself so if you just run that one command it will internally you know obviously a spark it, it, it spins up a spark job mm -hmm. and then within that it will self-manage all the resourcing that we need for ingestion if you're not ingesting it's going to do clustering if it's not clustering it's going to do compaction it even has resource management okay. so we made it like super super easy and uh um, the, the fun, the, so we actually have built a very similar thing at Uber and I actually started writing this tool as a, you know, like a replacement for it in open source. Yeah. But uh, I think we it, it's gotten so popular that it's used in many, many companies in production, mm -hmm. uh, right? A lot of, lot of those companies, um, this is the main thing. This is like the mm -hmm. main ingest service. So yeah, we that, that's what I'm trying to say. Like as a project, we've tried to make it very easy for the users because we um you know suffered through all this integration pains when we had to yeah. build our own tail like uber but in spite of that i feel still the operational overhead is too high i think i don't know like that's what one of us is trying to solve but yeah. hoodie already makes all this very easy for you okay so how this would work like with uh, open house like what's the what's the difference there one house, one, sorry, house. one house, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open is in the air so much these days. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so the thing is, we're not forking hoodie. We don't have a hoodie fork. Uh, we mm -hmm. are, so if you, if you look at how, uh, and even let's take like reliable SQS ingestion or S3 ingestion or something like that, usually we'll have a blog which describes an end to end architecture, right? Mm -hmm. We are platformizing the end to end architecture on top of Hoodie. It's almost like we're automating the blog that we wrote. Uh, you can still run Hoodie if you want. Like that, that's actually something that people really like, which is they can, uh, like a lot of our early users that like pilots that we're working with, that they are happy that they can start with something managed so they don't have like a long lead time for the lake house. Yep. And, but, if for whatever reason they don't like us, right? And uh, they, they can just turn around and, you know, all these services are in open source. They can just buy support from AWS and, you know, that's it, right? Uh, they can move off of one of those as well. Most open source GTMs are built, you know, go to market strategies or, okay, here is an open source project. Here is the enterprise uh, kernel on top of it. Yeah. I think we are trying something new where we are, we have an open product open source project we're trying to actually hide it as much as possible within our product because mm -hmm. we we want to up level the experience mm -hmm. then if you get really familiar for whatever reason we're not adding enough value to you you feel you should be able to move off the data is yours right yeah. i think this is the fundamental problem now you contrast it with the warehouse move this is the fundamental problem once you're stuck in the warehouse you have to migrate the data right if you're yeah. unhappy with it there's nothing you can do about it Mm -hmm. uh, so that is actually what we want to change. And like you're saying, it's a, it's a, as a product and as a kind of like also as a architecture and a category, it's something pretty like new and experimental, yeah. uh, architecture technology wise. Sure. It's pretty proven out, right? Your, your earlier question around this unbundled stack. See, whether we like it or not, whether one house exists or not, that's how people are, were using the lake even before hoodie yep. right uh, you are using parquet and using presto or uh, spark or hive that's literally how we started at uber as well so this mm -hmm. multiple engine on an open format kind of thing already existed uh, yep. before um 
I, I, I think all, all we're trying to do is build, build a path for users to get started on sooner. And hopefully as a company, mm -hmm. as a product, we add enough value that, you know, we can retain our users. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to make it a little bit harder for you, okay? Okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you like challenging. So let's say I'm a data engineer who's coming uh, like from uh, the modern data stack environment where I'm used to use, uh, let's say, Snowflake and the tool like Airbyte or um, Fivetran, right? Where I know that I'm going to sure. connect like a source, the data are yeah. going like, to be loaded on S3, then like a copy command is going to be executed on Snowflake, the data will get imported into the Snowflake um, yeah. um, table format, and then I'm able like to query that. And all these things happen like inside transactions, so nothing is going to get corrupted, sure. right? Sure, sure. Cool, and now that my boss says, go build a data lake. and. Okay, like we need like to expose it to the rest of the organization, so it should be like feel like the same, let's say as yeah. uh, Snowflake. Yeah. Okay, and I come to one house, right? How like think of me of like I have this experience in my mind, right? Like that's like the journey that I think when I, it comes like to loading data and like this whole ELT thing. Is this something that like I can do in a lake house in general, first of all, and second of all, like something that even if we can do cannot do today let's say uh like i can do i will be able to do that like in the future with one house is like how you think of things and um like how yeah. the experience should be yeah i think uh like so we, we first of all we think the experience should be similar to what what you're used to in an existing managed service right but how how we accomplish that in in one house can be through you know like uh us having more upstream partnerships, like uh, like for example, my my previous employer at Confluent. I think a lot of scenarios, uh, right? Uh, when people are at the point of thinking about data lakes and everything, they are also thinking about, okay, I want to open up event streams to uh, mm -hmm. my company, right? I want to open up for stream processing. So most of the things they would like, you know, they they would naturally do something to get extract all this data into a you know, like a big event bus like Kafka or Pulsar or Kinesis or one of these things, right? And the minute you get it into that, then it's 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 pretty simple, right? So you can use a, you know, ideally one house can like provide the same experience whether we run it or whether we partner. But but uh, I'm saying like we want to like we, right now we would recommend for people to rethink how they're doing data streams, yeah. right? Uh, like, okay, the CDC that you're capturing from Fivetran, uh, can you tee that into Elasticsearch? No, you can't, right? You can only send it to one point, which is Snowflake, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, that's, that's not the, forget who did data lakes and everything. That's not the, the you know, yeah. that's not what people ultimately build as a data architecture, right? And yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with like data meshes and we live in a world where there are like, there's enough data that there's like so many specialized stores. So mm -hmm. I think that will make this move much easier for us, I feel, uh, for something like one house, the, the move towards streaming data. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as technology, Huri is like very well pushed to be the, the absorb all the streaming data and integrate it very well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one house just has to focus on that problem. Uh, yeah. In my mind. Yeah, what I keep like from what you say is that, yeah, like things when it comes, let's say, to the lake house uh, category will get like, let's say, closer to what people are used to uh, use uh, from like cloud warehouses. But there's also like education that needs to happen, like people to understand that there are also like different ways that we can yeah. do things. And there's value in that, right? Like there is like it's not like you, you you lose just like how easy it is like to do something. You also gain, let's say, flexibility and opportunities like to optimize your uh, yeah. infrastructure and do more things with your data at the end, right? So I, I also feel like when people, when users, like the data engineer that you talked about is usually at a point where they're building a, a data lake for the company, they, they actually have a business problem to solve already. I mm -hmm. think it will they'll, they'll mostly look at it from that lens. For example, yeah. it can be stream processing. Data democratization is what kind of like what, what I just talked about. It yeah. could be just that, hey, I'm building a new data engineering team or a data science team. And there is all this like event logs and data yeah. that I can't even ingest into the warehouse anymore. It's not like 
it's yeah. replicating the same data that exists in a warehouse outside right i yeah. believe a lot more data sits out there on some s3 buckets and cloud storage buckets unmanaged completely today yeah. right yeah. Yeah. so i think there's vast amount of data that is not even getting into warehouses and now if you now think about it right uh, from this lens i don't think the existing managed uh, pipe uh, pl- like solutions are operating at that scale right they're not operating at the event scale like yeah. at uber we do like you know tens of millions of trips a day if we did that then we are ingesting hundreds or you know like a billion events per day like the, the, there's a scale difference in the amount of events and data volume mm-hmm. these are things that we've done right routinely in open source and we ourselves have actual to a you know hands on experience building yeah. so i feel technically scale wise it's a very different problem and when people consider it like they have one of those cost scale problems already yeah. and that will motivate the experience that we build and uh, but but by and large i think it will be fine yeah that's a, that's an excellent point and it's like it's a very fair point also because yeah like i'm i'm giving an example let's say but like the example and like the behavior that let's say someone has with a product cannot be taken out of context right like there's also like the problems that someone is trying to solve and you're absolutely right like when you reach the point where you need a data lake there are reasons for that it's not just because like you don't like snowflake right last question and then i give it yeah. like to um uh, to eric because i completely monopolized the conversation here <laughs> although he's going to be very kind and be like it was so enjoyable and like blah 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 all that stuff uh so we have seen lately uh both from uh, uh google with uh, the big lake initiative that they announced at some points but also with uh, snowflake with the support Uh, both as external tables with iceberg but also like in uh, as native uh, formats the we see like the data warehouses are also making let's say a move towards like more openness and like embracing let's say the lake house or data lake um, paradigm how do you think that this is going to affect um, one house as a vendor like in this space uh yeah. and how do you think this is going to evolve as part of like the uh the data warehouse experience that uh, we have seen so far in the cloud yeah so i think uh, let's let's take um uh, let, let's take the uh, even the uh, snowflake expansion and stuff right see the the key question i would ask is uh, how do external tables actually perform right it's mm-hmm. one thing to have an integration <laughs> um uh, but it's another thing uh, do they perform as well as native tables right because internally uh, you might have read the big metadata paper there's like a lot of metadata optimizations problems that the the transactional formats solve have been solved in a very different way in uh, warehouses so yeah. i think that there is going to be like a my feeling is um this is a nice uh, thing where you can actually access data but by and large people are going to move what, if they want something performance critical uh, they're going to move that cop into a native table and say this warehouse i think that's what i or i see i think it's very early right now it feels like uh, everybody wants to do something against data bricks and everybody <laughs> wants like a you know i have a lake house or they don't like whatever they talk, they want to use that's how it feels like uh, to me um so we will we'll see like of course you know it can also evolve over time end of the day warehouses still are used for traditional you know analytics use cases right there's like way much more beyond that can be unlocked in a the kind of model that we've been discussing so far so it'll be interesting to see how broad they want to be like warehouses want to make this right mm-hmm. so it's i'm not like saying that won't happen but historically like you know if you if you uh, project it out it, it it may or may not happen right yeah, yeah. um the the second thing here is overall let's look at this architecture now right let's say okay so we have a common format and then all the engines read and write from that um like the same table Uh, is written from like snowflake and bigquery and like you know, I, i haven't seen a use case like that mm-hmm. uh you know like why would you do external table you do external tables only because you want to do some spark processing on the same data that you want to also query right 
then if Spark's performance is good enough, won't you pick Spark? I, I, I just don't see, um, you know, clarity in uh, these individual yeah. use cases to a level, oh, for BI, only always use X. I don't, I don't see that kind of thing, right? Yeah. I see way more users, uh, you know, caring about, I want to actually keep my data more future-proof because, you know, four years ago or three years ago, nobody talked about Snowflake as the de facto kind of like, you know, warehouse that you dump everything. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it break through. So maybe in the next three years is something else. So I just want to keep my data future proof. This data will, you know, outlive the vendors and query engines, right? I see far more uh, companies worried about thinking from that perspective than this uh you know, I want to have this thin layer where I can read right yeah. from many engines. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's still early. And I think uh, it's going to be a couple of, like, interesting, at least, like, years ahead of us. Uh, at the end, uh, all these, like, um, innovation and, like, uh, product developments are hopefully are going, like, to be uh, beneficial for the customer, right? And I think it's also, like, from my uh, from my point of view, and like also like putting let's say my um, entrepreneurial hat, let's say mm -hmm. being like a new vendor in this space and seeing like these much bigger and like well established vendors like to be uh, investing towards like something that I'm also doing, it's good. Yeah, um, it yeah. means that like there is market there is appetite in the market for that kind of stuff. Now, who's going to win? I usually say that it's the smaller vendors that win in that kind of innovation. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Um, the, yeah. To that, so, to that point, actually, quickly, right? Like, see, see if you think about it, right? Uh, all of the... So who writes code in these systems? I think, like, if you, if you go back to who's, you know, pushing the, the, the also the transaction formats forward, I think that matters more, right? Mm -hmm. Because those people are the ones that are closer to the problems yeah. closer to the technology and that's kind of why uh, i think it reflects in the smaller vendors winning because they they're much much closer that's the only thing that they focus on yeah right and um, and yeah. overall it's great it i by the way like don't get me wrong I, I, it's absolutely fantastic that you know warehouses are now taking external tables super seriously right i i think redshift deserves a lot of credit for this they, they don't i'm not seeing anybody give them <laughs> spectrum added hoodie like you know, yeah. two years ago, and uh, you know they they deserve a lot of credit for that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a little bit of a shame because like okay, like there is some kind of perception that like Redshift is some kind of like let's say dead. Let's say in a way, although Redshift was the first cloud data warehouse out there, and they like the guys there, they keep building amazing technology. Uh, so people should keep paying attention to them like they are doing like a great job yeah yeah and i think yeah i mean this is like marketing right like this this is when marketing makes this reality i think i think as a as a as a founder now i also have the, the you know the job <laughs> of informing my team that hey like you know what what's marketing and what's like uh, this is like a pretty blurry line but yeah i mean there is uh, you know redshift i think makes maybe maybe a little bit more i don't know but i think in the same ballpark as some of the more successful you know, viruses that we talk about, yeah. right? And then they have like tens of thousands of customers. Um, yeah, this is where I think, uh, you know, for, for us, we, we've been like, you know, not, we, we've not, uh, we've so I would say we have the yearly mover disadvantage because when, you know, uh, like EMR, uh, and, you know, like, you know, like has like a lot of the AWS services are deeply integrated with Hoodie. And we didn't start one house back then because we couldn't, right? <laughs> but we're starting when the marketing, it's, we are not under the marketing, uh, um, you know, uh, shine spotlight as yeah. much uh, yeah. now. But I think uh, I've seen enough systems come and go that I know that, you know, uh, end of the day, the technology has to work and somebody has to operate this system and solve these customer problems. So we're yeah. like super, you know, I think we're pretty hopeful for both the, the open data lake houses and, and one house. Awesome, awesome. So Eric, as you can see, you are the king 
Like without you deciding that now we have to take Lake House seriously, nothing <laughs> happens out there. So you as the marketeer of this group of people yes. here, like we want to hear from you. No, I was laughing about you saying, you know, the line between marketing and sort of, you know, the product reality can be blurry. <laughs> you know, and that is uh, that's certainly true. Uh, what one last question for you? Mm. And I'm thinking about just the practical thinking about someone who's maybe thinking through the lake house on a practical level, right? So you talked about mm -hmm. the genesis of Hootie. You were you had real time needs at an immense scale, um, yeah. and then also a lot of the you know you know you mentioned sort of you know you have the bottom half of the, of the warehouse and you can run spark on it or like press Trino, et cetera. A lot of that tooling, I think to a lot of our listeners, probably at least hints at scale problems, right? Like a lot of those technologies mm -hmm. were developed mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. scale problems. One interesting yeah. thing that when we talked with Kyle from your team was that he said his opinion has been changing um, on the lake house, a sort of practical for companies that aren't at, you know, sort of whatever Uber, yeah. you know, esque yeah. scale. I just love your thoughts on that. I mean, is the, and, and maybe I can just frame it and sort of a slightly unfair frame it in the form of a slightly unfair question, but do you think that the lake house is at a point where a very forward thinking data team could say, we're just going to skip the data warehouse and we're going to go straight for the lake house and we're just going to use that and it will sort of be able to scale with us? Um, or do you still see a lot of companies hitting some of the limitations of, you know, sort of your traditional like data lake for object storage, um, you know, and then data warehouse for, you know, all the transactional sort of like day-to-day -day practical stuff? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. So I, I think it's a totally fair question. Right? Um, I think we are probably like a year or so from that. And, and I cite mostly all the DIY stuff that you need to do. Like, for example, somebody has to understand a Debezium, Postgres, uh, you know, Kafka, like just to build a simple Postgres to lake ingestion thing, right? Like, uh, so there's like a significant investment. And, and I've spoken to... Uh, smaller companies who basically know that the warehouse is going to get expensive and scale over time, but today it costs way less than three data engines, right? Yeah. So yeah. that is the problem that most people start, and that's where we are starting, right? With with that as a as a in a product and uh, from from that lens, the technology. If you look at it, uh, I think cost performance wise, I think grand scheme of things, I think it'll, it'll, it'll even out of the lake will be like. Lake is much, much cheaper for running any large data processes. Like about the where I look at the world today is barrels are, I think, in my opinion, still best in class when it comes to maybe like interactive query performance. You know, the work that's going into things like Presto Trino are changing all that, right? And then when you look at data processing ETLs, that is where it gets like really expensive. Now, the flip side of scale is cost, right? If you're yep. running at large scale means also large cost. So even moderate scale stuff, that's probably what Kyle in, like, hinted at. Even simple stuff, right? We can, in suspending 100,000 bucks, you can probably spend 30K on a, on a lake yep. uh, yep. as long as the, 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 the similar kind of experience existed. I think that is opening up and this is not possible without the cloud. I think mm. cloud is what is the, the you know, and, and, and the proliferation of all these different awesome engines. And that's actually what's uh, acting as a good, good kind of like catalyst for, mm for deriving uh, at that. So I don't see this as a, just a scale problem. And uh, although an interesting note, when we started Hoodie at Uber, I mean, for a year and a half or so, it was like, uh, you know, it, that's why you don't see, like we don't have a launch or anything. Right? It was like an interesting nerdy project that engineers at Uber built. Because yeah. not a lot of people had that kind of scale uh, with updates and this kind of thing then. But right, right now, just with the like, with time and then the data volume exploding, what we see routinely is, I'm surprised that like much smaller companies, the scale that they have. Uh, mm. Like, oh, oh, wow. Okay, you have a two terabyte partition. Okay, I did not see that. Like, you know, yeah. 
that's that's so there is also that I, and i my view has been as well evolving for a while i i myself to be honest thought like that which is like oh it's like a high scale problem you know like yeah 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 <laughs> uh, but then the community when i saw mm-hmm. the scale that they were like doing things at um that that changed me like i it just literally met a airline uh, data tracking system company they i think in just some tens of terabytes every day you we wouldn't have even heard about them like they track all the flight data across all the airlines in the us or something and then they they're able to get something up and running and they have that they can't send this data into a warehouse so they have right. a lake based solution so there is also that organic data volume growth that is pushing people more mm. towards this yeah super interesting i i can i can absolutely see that let's say in a year's time right you have you know say people who have been working at a larger scale company maybe they adopt some sort of lake house you know flavored technology then they go to work for a smaller company and they're like hey we yeah. can do like we can do this actually uh instead of waiting until the bill gets to 100 grand and then having to do you know sort of a complete like replatforming super interesting yeah it's going to change a lot in the next next 3 4 years uh and it's it's going to i think uh yeah i i think we have to get to a point where it, it's feasible right you can you can like no cost no trade offs to your yeah. uh, timelines you can get started with, with this thing yep yeah it makes total sense um awesome well i think we went long but that's because brooks let me record this time uh so we get to break the rules <laughs> so, uh, which is always great uh but uh, this has been such a great conversation uh we learned a ton as always and um We'll need to have you back for sort of a third times a charm uh round on the data stack show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely love to and and thanks for all the awesome questions. That that's one of the you know the things that I really enjoy is the the quality of the questions and you know it gets really push me <laughs> 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 on the hard stuff. So yeah, this is fun. That we should definitely do it on. Well, that's a a very high compliment. So thank you so much and uh and we'll talk soon. All right. Awesome. But not that was great. Welcome to the Data Stack Show prequel. We just recorded a show with Vinath, one of the creators of Apache Hudi, and we got to ask him about his new company. Well, maybe we should just leave that as a teaser. Uh for the listeners, what he think Costas. Was that mean? Ah, oh, no, no, no. I I think it's it's great. Like we don't have like to name the company. I guess like probably people will already know uh about the company anyway. Yeah. I mean it's they are doing like a great job with marketing so far and uh, spreading the word out there about the company and the relationship with the project Apache Hudi. So it's going to be okay, I think. Yeah, I agree. I just had to start with a little teaser there. Put a cliffhanger, but I will say I think one of the one of the most interesting and helpful things to me about the conversation that we just had was understanding the uh or or better understanding the uh different components of sort of data lakes and data warehouses as they are as they create value for different users and then optimize towards different goals right so sort of usability versus cost etc and i feel like we just got such a good picture of how those things are converging um right because traditionally a lot of those concerns have been very separated and i think way more rapidly than i realized they are converging um and creating the opportunity to do some really cool stuff right so i mean one thing we talked about to give a little teaser was like sort of bring your own like query interface right um which is a really interesting concept because to vinat's point like a lot of these things are sort of big vertically integrated stacks yeah. so that was that was fascinating but what uh what stuck out to you um i mean i think we we focus a lot on let's say the rivalry between uh the lake house architecture and uh the data warehouses which okay it has been created in a way because of let's say um 
the relationship between uh, Databricks and uh, Snowflake. But uh, we forget that initially, at least, and I think it's still the case that data lakes um, have been created like for different use cases, right? Like data warehouse was and still is and probably will always be like the right environment if you want to do, let's say, BI and if you want to do like analytics, right? Um, data lakes were not like initially built for that. Now, the lake house says that you can also do that, but the most important part is that you also have the, the rest of the use cases that usually are like more into some very heavy type of processing, like doing ML stuff, like working with like very big and complex like workloads and stuff like that, right? Um, so that's what I keep because it's very easy, let's say, to um, forget about that. Uh, and um, like, we not like mentioned that at some point at the end, like, yeah, I mean, at the end, lake houses and data lakes uh, are also enabling like a set of use cases that you cannot do on the data warehouse. Yeah. And that's like where the value is, right? Like, that's why we need that. It's not just like a marketing, let's say, uh, strategy to make people buy the same thing, but they think that they buy something different, right? Like. Yeah. It's 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 something else, and like that's why you see like in many companies the two solutions to coexist, right? Like we have data warehouses together with data lakes and lake houses. Yep. So uh, that's what I keep from the conversation. And uh, yeah, I mean, outside of this, as always, it was like a, an amazing technical conversation with someone who uh, knows deeply what he's talking about. And uh, that's something that I always like um, enjoy when I talk with him. So yeah, I'm looking forward to chat again with him in the future. You had a great exchange about compaction, which was fascinating. Um... Uh, yeah, we talked about that, about compaction. We talked about the different services in general that yeah. need to be built on top of the data lake to bring it closer to the data warehouse. So yeah. If anyone wants like to learn more about that stuff, I'm not going to disclose more. Ah, they we've should. already gone too long. <laughs> yep, sure. We've already gone too long yeah. in the prequel. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a great show. You won't want to miss it. Subscribe if you haven't to get notified of the updates. Tell a friend about the show and we will catch you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.